Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this month's free webinar. Um, welcome to you wherever you are in the world. Tonight, we're going to go into the carb fat debate, um, which has basically been a, a domain of sports nutrition for the last half century. And I'm going to delve into the views of carb is king and fat is fab. Um, I'm going to do a shorter presentation than normal, somewhere between 20 and 30 minutes. Um, I've got my colleague Adam Lloyd here. He's going to give his inputs. And we've got potentially Paul Loren coming on as well, although he's had internet issues today. But the other members of this discussion are you, because I'm wanting good participation this evening. So... Let's get warmed up. Firstly, where are you in the world? I like to know where people have uh, zoomed in from. What do you do? What's your interests? And normally I ask, what would you like to learn during this, uh, this evening's webinar? But tonight I've changed it to share because most people have, a, have an opinion on this topic. Um, it's... Um, it's a domain of the scientists arguing it out that has come into popular blogging and podcasts and discussions and all over social media. So let's go into this without further ado. Okay, in the red corner, we have Mr. Potato Head. In the blue corner, we have Mr. Baconhead. Okay, so who's going to uh, win this fight? And it's been a fight that's um, been ongoing for quite some time now. And it's, I say this in jest, but in reality, this goes on in science because um, scientists tend to delve into the detail and defend their space very strongly. Okay, thanks, Tracy, for sending through where you are. Asheville is beautiful. I, I used to be at Greensboro for my master's degree. So let's just go forward to an example. And that's within the high fat, low carb, or the high carb, low fat kind of domain. So here's an old mentor of mine. Uh, that's Tim Noakes at the University of Cape Town, who I used to know in person. And he used to be within the carb domain. Um, he would follow the standard sports nutrition practices. But in about 2013, he suddenly started personally trying fat, high fat diets because he was gaining, gaining weight. He actually ended up with diabetes. And he got much better control of his weight and his energy and so on. And then he basically um, shouted from the rooftops. And what he said was that, oh, apologies, apologies, I've just uh, moved the meeting chat. Adam, can I have a, some feedback again? Um, on the display, yeah, are you yes. seeing the meeting chat and the participants, or is it just the screen? Uh, at the moment, it's, it's your slides. Just the slides. Okay, that's fine. Okay, it's just when I move a meeting chat window then uh, the the uh, the slides collapse there so i'll just try and see what's on my slides so he said that um carbs are basically making us all obese and it's linking to chronic diseases that was 2015 that he released his bestseller book almost the same year this guy colin campbell he re-released the China study, and his premise was that the amount of protein in our diets was directly correlated with risk of cancer. Now, there's contextual issues there. It depends who you study. So like nobody's uh, mentioned before that, you know, he's studied Chinese people, but he's mapping it out across the world. I think that's a very relevant point. But the other thing I want to say about these two is they're both incredible scientists and both books are heavily backed up with scientific research. 
But of course, as we, we should know, if you go looking for scientific support of your beliefs, you will generally find it. So you have to start with an unbiased opinion, but that's kind of difficult to come by. So let's move on. I'm going to do a play for the carbs and then a play for the fat. Okay, so let's go into the American College of Sports Medicine within uh, sports nutrition, sports medicine, sports science. It's a very respected organization. So what do they say about it? Carbs are important to maintain blood glucose levels during exercise and to replace muscle glycogen. Recommendations range from three to 12 grams per kilo per body, kilo body weight per day, depending on the activity. Now, the range used to be a lot more narrow than that. So they have loosened their recommendations a wee bit. Protein levels have gone up from what they used to be, because they used to be uh, considered the same as a sedentary person, which uh, I was very dubious of, but they've shifted that. And then with fat, they're kind of sitting on the fence. They recognize that we need a certain amount of fat, but they're not yet recommending high fat diets for athletes, although they respect that for the research is needed but very much it, it's still within the the red corner i believe it was mr potato head of carbohydrates are still the the dominant force in sports nutrition i'm going to throw quizzes out to you uh, during this evening it worked really well last month so i'm working for engagement here so let's see who can answer the the, the most quiz questions There is an assumption in the next slide coming up. I want you to try and spot it. Right, so this is a very old research study looking at the effects of moderate and high intakes of carbohydrate between daily training sessions on muscle glycogen. So basically, what was happening is uh, subjects were doing two hours per day of a training endurance training bout, which was reducing the muscle glycogen levels. And then, depending on the way they ate in between, the muscle glycogen would, would either lift up and be close to entry levels, or it would gradually decline over the, the testing period. Okay, so what is the assumption that they're making here? They're very clearly demonstrating that if you're on a low carb diet, your glycogen levels drop. What's the assumption of the importance of that? And I'll give you another slide to answer that. So nobody's answered yet. So let's uh, get your thinking caps on. This is another really old one. I'm sharing old ones because literally in the 70s, 80s, even a little bit in the 60s, they did a lot of carbohydrate research. It was very easy to do muscle biopsies. It was very easy to put somebody on a bike or a treadmill and to, to do endurance type protocols and then measure, measure muscle glycogen levels. So very easy to measure. This one was looking at blood glucose levels Throughout an exercise trial, this was cyclists cycling at 71% of their VO2 peak, which is, a, let's say, a good steady pace for as long as they could. And every 20 minutes, they're either given a, a, a drink with sweetener, the placebo, or they're given a, a drink with sugar to potentially support their blood sugar levels. So you can see it's a very, very clear difference. Um, the placebo group went for about three hours, which is a long enough exercise, but the, um, the sugar group went for about an hour longer. So then from studies like this, you started hearing, oh, take uh, Lucozade Sport or Gatorade and you'll compete for 50% longer. So there's only a partial truth in that, of course, but it was a clear demonstration during exercise like this some carbohydrate dosage could improve performance quite significantly. And that hasn't changed over the years. It's not like we've suddenly got different results on these kinds of trials. Okay, so uh, I need to stop touching that chat button. Um, so you've all failed on the quiz question. So let's just go back to it. <clears throat> What's the assumption on this slide? 
Okay, All right, here we go. They were likely studying partic participants that consumed high carb diets prior to the study. Yeah, potentially. The assumption that high carb diet is more supportive of more activity. It's not quite what I was looking for. What I was looking for is the assumption is that the glycogen levels shown here would directly correlate to performance. Of course, subsequent research has shown that, yes, it has a big effect, but there is an assumption that you're not actually measuring performance here uh, or reproducible performance. Okay, so just watch out for the assumptive uh, pretty graphs that we get. Right, let's move on to fats. So I'll just start with this, um, this 2017 research uh, study called Feeding Influences Adipose Tissue Responses to Exercise in Overweight Men. Now, there's a contextual thing. We often get studies like this that will be then mapped out to, let's say, athletic men or athletic women, or it's a male study mapped over to women or vice versa, non-athletic and athletic. So we need to think of who are the, who are the subjects. What this research study found was that feeding before acute exercise affects post-exercise adipose tissue gene expression and we propose that feeding is likely to blunt long-term adipose tissue adaptation to regular exercise. In other words, if you were to take those carb slides that I've just been through, yes, it might help performance, but it's going to blunt your adipose tissue. Of course, we're, we're comparing apples with pears here because those previous studies were, were in more active um, athletes or at least very active recreational individuals compared to an overweight scenario where we're trying to drop some weight off them. So there's another sort of little research thing, little research tip. What's the context? Uh, who are the subjects? What are they trying to measure? Quiz number two. In the context of sports performance, there is a but in the next slide. Okay, so the next slide looks really good for fat, but what is the... What is the but? So this is the study of Volek, who's, uh, who's quite famous in the, the high carb um, literature. And basically what Volek did was he got subjects either doing a high carb standard sports diet. So if you look at like ACSM guidelines and the likes, it's generally sort of 60, sometimes even 70% of the diet coming from carbohydrates compared to a very specifically high fat diet, which was, was about 70% of the overall calories coming from fat, which is an enormous amount of fat that doesn't leave much space for carbs and protein in the diet. Okay, so a very big challenge there. What did he find? Well, he got these subjects to run for three hours at 64% of VO2 max and then have a two-hour recovery. What he found, you can see here, the high-carb group and the low-carb group, a very clear increase in peak, peak fat oxidation. So this is something that can be measured in the lab, and it's sometimes called, called uh, fat mass, uh, fat, fat max, rather. And how fast a turnover of ATP can you produce just from fat? versus needing carbohydrates. So that's a very clear increase in potential performance coming from fat. And one person even got over 80%. But there's a but there. And within that context of performance, what is it? Here's another, another little view. So they're very clearly showing better fat oxidation there. And worse carbohydrate oxidation okay so what is that but but not everyone responds this way so yes you're right so some people after that big fat adaptation period they were still under 60 percent whereas some people were well over 60 percent with the higher higher fat scenario 
sorry, higher carb scenario. The, the but that I'm kind of um, fishing for a little bit here is within sports performance, how many events sit at 80% of VO2 max? There's not many events that don't require us to go up to 100% and beyond. Okay, VO2 max, maximum aerobic capacity. We need to get up there. Even uh, I tend to support more endurance oriented athletes. And I've worked with people up to like 100 mile trail runs and multi day events. And it's certainly not run at 80, 90% of your two max, but what happens when they go up a mountain peak? So it's like an hour of half gra hard graft up the mountain peak, or they're quite competitive and they're surging for a, a new place or to catch up somebody. So these are just the question marks there. So yes, we can adapt somebody to better fat metabolism, but the question is, how much does it matter in the context of my sport and my person, my personal life? Here's another little thing on the fat side. This is a quite a complex slide that I've put together from various different studies. But basically, if you look at, uh, you might have heard of AMPK, that's a feeder of PGC1A. Basically, they're precursors to mitochondrial biogenesis. In other words, new mitochondrial growth, and better functioning. And all of these things across the top are some kind of metabolic stress on the body. So yes, if we go low carb, we create more metabolic stress and we can get these signaling mechanisms coming on. The same with fasted training that we can create that. So hmm, through the study of low carb, we've learned a few things as well, even if we don't always agree with it. So let's go into what I call balance and context. So do we need to play this opposites game? Uh, I've got a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old. So with a nine-year-old at the moment, if I say black, he says white. If I say good, he says bad. Uh, so yeah, it's very much an opposites game. And scientists can often play these games as well. So it's a stereotypical black, white, aspect in science. But for those of you who know and have studied science, the scatter plot should be very, um, very familiar. Just like politics, the average person sits somewhere in the middle, or maybe left of center, right of center. You get the odd one that sits out on these extremes, and they're what Malcolm Gladwell is termed outliers, but of course he got that, the name for his book from science because outliers is a term for these people sitting right out on the wings here. So in other words, we need to consider genetics. Some people do really well on, on that Volick study, like the person that got over 80% VO2 max on, a, on just fats. Whereas people, some people do dreadfully and they, they need a lot of carbohydrate in their diet. So quiz number three, forgetting the simplicities of macronutrients. So last month I went into support of mitochondria and the first step was macros, but I went into a lot of other things. What does your gut tell you about the healthiest types of diets? Okay, so it's not just the carbs and fats. What is a healthy diet? And the, the strap line of our company is health feeds performance. So if we have that assumption, hmm, okay, maybe we should look at healthy types of diets as well as just the macro ratios. So let's look at genetics and metabolism. Um, I've done various genetic tests over the years, you know, quite a few. Um, to be honest, over 10, 12 year period. If somebody was a great fat metabolizer and a bad carb metabolizer, that's the kind of picture that you would see. But how many times have I actually seen that in 10 years? Eh, zero. In reality, this is the average. Some are, some are moderate, some are mixed. You know, it, it, it varies incredibly, but Seeing some of the extremes on both um, is very, very rare. I have worked with the odd 
person that hasn't actually have shown the genetics of this, but through working with them nutritionally, you figure out, yes, you actually need to go super low carb or sometimes opposite as well. All right, so variability is really, really key. This is quite an old study now, and it's in an era where I didn't realize they were even looking at variability. And I want you to just look at one of the authors here. This is Tim Noakes. So way before he got into his fat um, you know, campaign, he was recognizing this. The effects basically in variability and exercise capacity is highly variable between individuals and independent in the changes of carb oxidation. So yes, there's huge in genetics. We need to be following this research up rather than pigeonholing vast areas of population into carb or fat scenarios. So let's go back to the diet. We've got Dave, congratulations for being the only person to answer that. What should be a simple question? Diet should be varied and suited to the individuals. That's brilliant. When I, so there's the genetics. When I look at healthy diets, I actually look at, look at what we used to eat. So I look at like the old Scottish diet or the old English diet, or I used to live in South Africa. What did they used to eat there? Um, I, I'm really fascinated by indigenous groups that still live um, an indigenous lifestyle, such as this newspaper report I found a few years ago. So what did they eat? Well, we've got wild boar, we've got um, catfish, we've got kind of sweet potato and um, yam and that sort of um, starchy vegetables. And then the rest is kind of gathering berries and nuts and, and the likes. What was the percentage carbohydrate of their diet that somebody you know, actually <laughs> went and found out? It was somewhere around 70% carbohydrate. But that's irrelevant to me. What I'm seeing is a very healthy balance and they're being reported as having the healthiest hearts in the world. So hmm, let's maybe drop the reliance on these numbers and focus on what entities, i.e. what foods are in the diet. Okay, so I'm gonna turn into turn that discussion into more of a sports performance aspect. So looking at ATP flux rates and volumes, I'm gonna go back to that Volex study. We have a lot of fat, even as skinny people have lots of fat, but the rate's not very high. In order to get up to that VO2 max kind of intensity, we need carbs. In order to get into anaerobic territory, we need even more carbs. So it's going to depend on what we're actually looking at um, in terms of sporting endeavors. If you're playing football, for example, it's an intermittent sprints event, you're going to need both. You need a good underpinning fat oxidation and carb oxidation and an ability to charge into this fast glycolysis in a carbohydrate environment. So we're not focusing on carb adapted or fat adapted here, we're talking about what's been termed metabolic flexibility, which is a term I quite like. How well do we metabolize anything that we get? Let's take a really long distance event, like uh, we, we enjoy watching the Tour de France every year. And these guys are not on 70% fat diets, even though it's very long duration, and they won't often be getting up over 70% VO2 max. But when they need to, they need to. These guys eat anything that they can pretty much get down, digest, and metabolize. Trail running, 24-hour trail running, yes, I'd be more akin to doing a fat adaptation period, but I'd move on to what we're about to talk about next. And that is train low, compete high. So with the fat theories, we've recognized that there is this limitation that maybe if we have a high fat, low carb diet, we're not gonna be able to get into those high carb ATP flux rates. 
So how about we actually train low to try and get these some of these fat adaptations and mitochondrial adaptations working, and then glycogen load for competing. So that's one theory, and it's been around for a while. This paper by Barr and McGee in uh, 2008, it's a really good balanced read if you want to go and have a look. What they were saying is that athletes training in a glycogen-depleted state will maximize certain physiological adaptations to exercise, like I've just spoken about. But then glycogen loading before race day will then maximize the performance. Oh, okay, win-win. So let's have a little explore of that. So we're going to look at, well, how appropriate is it to train in a low-carb state? Here's a, here's a sort of little backup of, yes, it is a good idea. And this study is showing that we can increase the activation of AMPK, which, if you remember, is a feeder of the um, mitochondrial biogenesis under conditions of low muscle glycogen, which will enhan enhance GLUT4 expression in response to exercise in skeletal muscle. And that's great. GLUT4 is to do with uh, glucose uptake and use. So we, we want to improve insulin sensitivity and use of glucose and so on. So this is a really good thing. And this is a kind of basis of a lot of research that's now looking at intermittent fasting and fasted training sessions and so on to try and improve insulin sensitivity. But if that is a positive thing, at the same time as improving insulin sensitivity, it will bring down things like inflammation. But, the, but it's a double-edged sword, and let me explain that. The question from a research study like this is, yes, it would be best to train in a glycogen-depleted state, but there's always a, there's always a but. And I could I do, on our bigger course, do a longer presentation on this, and there's various things that we can look at, but I'm going to choose one paper to share. And that's by a guy that I respect, funnily enough, from... <laughs> the location of our first member who shared where she was from, and that's Asheville, North Carolina. So David Neiman, I saw him when I was in North Carolina. He's a exercise immunologist, been around for donkey's years. And he looked at inflammatory responses and stress hormone responses to heavy training bouts and how carbohydrate availability or not would influence that. So let's have a look at uh, what you found. So carbohydrate compared to placebo ingestion during cycling at, uh, I can't see, I think it's 60% of watt max, attenuated the increase in plasma cortisol, epinephrine, or we call it adrenaline in the UK, interleukin-6, interleukin-10, interleukin-1RA. These are potentially pro-inflammatory cytokines. When we exercise hard, we tend to go into a pro-inflammatory state, which is good to a point because it helps adaptation. But if we overdo it, then we have too long a recovery period and then it stunts our progression. So again, another double-edged sword. So if you too often train in a low-carb state or a fasted state, you're going to be stimulating these inflammatory responses too much. You're also going to be stimulating cortisol and stress hormones too much. Cortisol plays bat and ball with insulin. Cortisol on its own can really mess up blood sugar control and, and stimulate long-term insulin resistance. So it's the opposite of what we've just said from the previous research, research study. So hopefully you, you understand what I mean by a double-edged sword now. So when you have the, the low carb availability camp, you always have to ask them, okay, well, what, what's the downside of this? And if we're talking about having carbs until it's coming out of our ears, you have to say, well, what's the downside of that? So I always question. All right, so within the elite space, within the performance space. I respect the work of uh, Sam Impey, who I brought along to a conference once in London. 
and he shared similar research around this. So basically, he took elite cyclists in a well-fed state versus a low-carb state, and this is what he, he found. I'm, I'm shortcutting the study a little bit here. But basically, this the gray block here is the training period. Um, it was a hard training period and then a recovery period. And you can see a moderate improvement in AMPK activity in a low-carb state. They added in leucine to try and improve the anabolic support because they knew that low carb could actually limit anabolic uh, activity. So that seems like a good thing, but here's the other side. This activity, which I'll go into now, Basically, what they were showing is this activity was stunted a little bit in the low carb state. And what does this mean? It essentially means mTOR signaling, which we understand is a signaling mechanism for muscular growth, for anabolic repair. It's a very important, got a very important job, plays a role in protein synthesis and in cell growth uh, control via enhanced translation of certain MRI species. Okay, so a complex, complex language there, but essentially low-carb state meant potentially less anabolic adaptation after the exercise. Okay, and you can see that the higher carb scenario kicked into a recovery state much, much quicker. So the context is important. And Sam MP, James Martin, and that group at Liverpool John Moore University who work with these elite cyclists, they've got a good strategy. When cyclists are doing an easy day or a sort of easy training session, they might do it fasted, so low carb availability. If they're doing hard intervals or they're doing a more prolonged, higher intensity ride, they'll make sure they're well carb fed. Okay, so I think that's a good strategy. I'm just going to sort of finish here with my question. What about a moderate fat diet? So we've got those early research studies, which are very carb dominant. We've got the more recent ones like Volek that's saying, well, fat is actually much better. But 70% of your diet coming from fat is an awful lot of fat. This one said that data from the present study suggests that higher levels of fat, up to 40%, so I don't know about you, but 40% fat in the diet to me is fairly moderate. I remember when I went into nutritional therapy from sports nutrition, sports nutrition was maybe talking about much lower fat and higher carbohydrate. We went in and we talked about blood sugar regulation and healthy food for the gut and when I started going back to numbers again for a while, 40% fat was generally okay, as long as it's good quality fat and a nice balance between your saturates and your unsaturates and your omega-3 and 6, et cetera. So that to me is a nice balance. So that, that can increase endurance running time without adverse effects on plasma cortisol and these inflammatory aspects of exercise. Hmm. The 70%, the high fat approach or lack of carbohydrates was showing adverse effect on stress hormones and inflammatory markers. So maybe a moderation would work. This is the only study I have found in the sporting realm looking at this. So we need a lot more investigation. Right, so my conclusion of fats versus carbs is Consider the whole context of the person, where they live, what they're doing, what their sport is, and don't be an extremist, unless you've got good reason to do so and in a controlled environment. Okay, so I am going to unshare. I'm going to invite Adam on to share his views, and then we're going to open to the rest of you. Adam, are you there? Hi, Ian. Yeah, Hi, I'm Brad. here. Hi, good to see you. Good to see you. Um, so have you got some uh, 
personal perspectives. I used to, uh, I forgot to use the word perspective earlier. That's something that I do, I try to do, get that bird's eye view of a topic. So I'm interested in other people's perspectives. So Adam, what do you think? Yeah, uh, great. Well, I thought it was really interesting and, and um, it's great to get the, the context and the background of where these, um, the, the things that we see in books and where they've come from and and uh, and all of that and I'll be really interested to hear what everyone else has to say as well and um, I think that uh, if I if I take it from a um, the perspective of going so I, I work in a football club in uh, in League One in the in the um, English Football League and um, I had I sort of finished my um, studying and went in with lots of grand ideas about how we might be able to get these players to perform better. And I think, you know, uh, what you've just finished with is, was kind of presented with me right away was that you, you, you're faced with an individual, you're faced with, with um, amounts of either fat or carb, depending on where we're going to go. And you have to turn that into a reality for that person that stood in front of you. Um, and before you can even do that, you've got to try to understand where this, where this person is at. And um, what I found was that um, most of the time, the, the, the football players that I was working with thought that they had a very good understanding of what the role of, of carbohydrates and fats and protein was in the body. And yet when you dug a little bit deeper, um, their, their understanding was, um, was not quite right or was slightly, you know, skewed and and so we we end up what, what what i sort of thought of whilst you were talking ian was that you 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 get um well, it depends when you whether you're thinking from a sports nutrition perspective or whether you are thinking from a general nutrition perspective and these a lot of these players were coming from a general nutrition perspective uh, and i'll give some examples about that uh, what i mean by that in a minute and they, they didn't understand what, the, what was happening in the body and what they needed to, to fuel performance. What they understood was perhaps what um, John next door had read in the Daily Mail or you know, something like that, that, that passes very quickly and that gets into the mainstream very quickly. Um, and so you, know, you, would have, uh, you would have people taking protein shakes before playing because it gives you energy. Um, and that sort of uh, misconception of what that, the role of that macronutrient is. And, and they're not to, to blame for this either, because I've since, you know, picked up many a protein drink that has, you know, energy all over the, the marketing of that drink, you know? And, uh, and so players going into it, w w wondering why, you know, 20 minutes from the end of the game, they, did, they know they should have a little bit more, but they haven't quite got it. And they're, and they're wondering why, you know? Um, and so the, the, one of the examples I, I, I would give about this was it was a player. This is this is going back a few years now, but um, it was a player who came from a household of, um, of type two diabetics. So his mother and father were both uh, type two diabetics. And he had a, a very set view about the role of carbohydrates. And it was a it was a uh, it was a situation where he was he was very limiting, you know, very. Uh, restricted in his in his intake of carbohydrates and yet when we spoke to him about what he thought his performance challenges were it was all about energy and it was all about how do I get that last bit out of it I, I just feel like that they're going a bit quicker than I and you know on the face of it it seems um, so obvious but actually it was really it was quite a challenge because um, the, the the ideas of of carbs are bad and carbs make you fat. And, uh, you know, I couldn't possibly eat that for breakfast knowing that I had to play later on. And so it's a really long process to try to, to talk, to, to strip it back and actually really talk about the physiology, what's going on in the body. And, and often um, time is precious in, in, you know, in sporting environments, you know, you don't get that time. So you, you have to try to build trust really quickly and get some quick messages across. Um, so, and I'd also like to just give another example, which is that, that was perhaps more on the carbohydrate side of trying to convince somebody that, you know, we need to do something different to what your parents are doing because your activity is different to what your parents are doing. I had a, a, another player who, who, um, who had to try to keep secret from the club that he was struggling with, with an IBD, uh, inflammatory bowel disease. And it was a condition that was really, really um, 
all consuming for him and uh, high stress. Um, and, and yet this, this particular individual was um, p- perhaps doing all the things around simple carbohydrates just before playing. And it was wreaking havoc on his system. And, uh, but of course he couldn't tell anybody because in those type of environments, high performance environments, you do not want to tell anybody that you cannot perform. Uh, and so he, he had to hide it and had to hide it. And it was, a, again, an, another example of we had to look at different ways to fuel that individual. And, and again, we go back to the individual of it. When we looked at how those two players played, they played very differently. They were, you know, and almost, again, because I'm into nutrition and I love nutrition, it was, you could almost see that the way in which they how much they uh, liked a certain type of food or, or avoided a certain type of food played out in how they were as a football player. One was quick down the wing, the other one liked to sit and hold, you know? And it was really, really fascinating. Um, and then, and then the, the, so the other perspective I would, I would also add to this, and I think everybody on, on the call will probably know this already uh, and would be saying this if I wasn't saying it myself, but, you know, when we when we've got these players and we want them to perform for 90 minutes on a Saturday, um, the rest of the minutes in their week are often ignored. You have to perform at three o'clock and we need you to perform from three o'clock until about five o'clock. Right. And, and everything goes into that. Well, we had a um, we had a player who was um, so, so the example is what they do outside of those 90 minutes is extremely important. And, and, if they've got high stress in their personal life, then um, the fat carb debate kind of, you know, wh- how we're fueling that individual. He, he, he had a huge amount of stress going on outside of the football club. Um, whatever we would have done, if we'd have gone 70% fat in the diet, if we'd have gone uh, 70% carbohydrates in the diet, he just couldn't turn over. He couldn't turn over until, this, until these personal issues were resolved. And then when they were resolved, he came back. And I think that, again, we, we have this, this other factor here, which is our mind and our ability and our ability to apply ourselves to, to what's being, uh, being asked of us, which, again, I think when we go into a lab and we, and we test these things out, one of the assumptions within that is that, you know, you, you know you're going to, to sit on a bike, you know you're going to pedal, so you're, you're okay with that, you know, and so it tells us, it tells us some interesting things. Um, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't necessarily, or it's not all encompassing, you know, the ideas are not all encompassing. Um, and then uh, my, my final point, Ian, I'm not, um, uh, yeah, hopefully not going on too long, but the final point was, was um, I find that, that you talked about Sam Imney's uh, work and uh, some of that stuff is, is fascinating and is certainly, certainly filtering down the pyramid um, in terms of nutritional practice. Um, one of the challenges I've, I've faced with that is that very rarely does a does an SNC coach um, w- w- very rarely would they sanction a training session where those players weren't going to be optimally ready to perform. You know, so so if I say to them, I I think we should trial something like this, but it may mean that we see a drop off in performance for this session in some of them, but the longer term will be beneficial. We are, I'm not going to get that. I'm not going to get that sanctioned, you know, because uh, they, you know, rightly so that would compromise their job. They, you know, and, and, and so, so it's a really interesting and, and, and sometimes you, you have to, you have to go back to the, the, the leaders in our environment and, and the leaders tend to be at the, at the biggest clubs um, for the information to filter down before you can be a maverick at your, at your club, you know, um, and so I think that's my that's my sort of my take on this. And, and again, I would having having come through um, your mentorship, Ian, I would say that I, I agree with the, the final slide that, you know, we have to be able to react to, to the to the client that's in front of us uh, and with it and work within the context and the realms of what they they have to work within. Thanks for your, your input there, Adam. Um, I mentioned Paulie, I think he's still got internet issues because he's not on with us. So we're just going to hop to a quick ad break, folks, and then uh, we're going to open up to everyone. Okay, so just uh, I want to share what's coming up.
So starting in October, we've just been running our short course, and I know some of you online are doing that at the moment. So we're coming up to the, the long course, as we're now calling it, or the Certificate of Integrative Sports Nutrition that starts uh, at the end of October. And that's basically a 30 week, three modular course. And that's supported by Bant and Basies. And uh, it's a, a good immersion, a big immersion in study, okay, if you're interested in this area. And the other one, which is very popular, is the Natural Sports Cookery course is coming up. That's a one modular uh, course that's coming up also at the end of October. And that would run through the month of November. Uh, that's with my wife, Rachel. OK, right. I'm quick with ads, unlike the radio stations. Right, so I want to invite some discussion now. So. Let me just find people to pick on. Right. Jenny was saying, most people fall somewhere in the middle. The outliers are, are rare. How do you determine if they should go towards a low carb or low fat? If your client doesn't have a genetic test, is it through feedback? OK, I'm going to. Jenny, would, will you come on? Will you um, give me your thoughts on that question first? Just tell me if you're shy. Hi there, Jenny. Just unmute yourself. Can you not unmute? Oh, okay, you can't get the mic to work. All right, so I'll just uh, try and address that question. How do you how do you know? I mean, for a while when the genetic tests started coming out, I, I used them a lot and sort of gained a bit of experience. But I, at the same time, I was gaining experience through um, just watching people. And the best thing you can do as a practitioner is just kind of learn from your from your clients and that kind of middle ground aspect that you saw in the scatter plot. Maybe you go there first. And then deviate with time so ideally you're working with a client for a number of sessions you're just you're not trying to get it all perfect in the first session and make that very clear to them that you're not a wizard. Um, so. Another good question you can ask them, if they come in for weight management, you can say, well, have you done any weight loss type diets in the past? And if so, what have you found most effective? And they might say, oh, I've done the keto diet or I've done the Weight Watchers diet and they'll give you input as to what works better. Should regular feeding work better or intermittent fasting? And you're, and you're listening. But then also, work out what they're coming in with, because most people will come in with something, some kind of dietary form that they might be skipping their breakfast because they perceive that's good for cutting down on their calories, but they're struggling with energy later on. Just try and pick up on their patterns. The other ones are, uh, you know, if you're working with a performance athlete who's doing endurance stuff, Ask them, let's say they're a cyclist, because I've worked with lots of cyclists. When you do your three, four, or five hour Sunday long ride, what do you eat before? And some will say, yeah, I have a good breakfast and then I'm snacking on bars and drinks all the way through. Others will say, I have a cup of, cup of coffee and that kind of does me, carries me through. And then we stop for um, breakfast at the end of it or brunch or something. And I'll start with a coffee and then maybe have some bacon and eggs. And that tells you straight away that their body's not shouting at them for the carbs. Whereas other people, you know, as soon as they get into that coffee shop, they're drinking fruit juice or some sweet drink. So the body, tuning into the body, ask them to do that and, and you listen very, very carefully. 
Um, okay, let me know if that answers your question, Jenny. Emma is saying, uh, I'd question any genetic tests that make such a simplistic and extreme statement as indicating very high carbs or very high fats, just based on genetics without any consideration of lifestyle, activity, etc. Okay, so Emma, Emma has her own genetic company and absolutely 100% agree. Um, you need to bring it into the context. The genetic tests I was sharing were for practitioners to work with clients, and that has to be the case. But I did know of occasions where the genetic test would come straight to consumer, and then they're they're just looking at the algorithm, the pretty pretty graphs on it because they can't understand the language. So yes, you as a practitioner sit with them for at least an hour and listen to them and ask them questions like this, understand their challenges, understand their histories. And then that genetic information comes in as an extra layer. So what I've started describing this process as is, if you take my picture of Table Mountain on the, the wall behind me and just wipe it clean so it's a white, a white um, <laughs> canvas. If it's a white canvas, as you're taking a history, you're, you're doing some brush strokes. You're creating a rudimentary picture of your client. As you gain experience through one, two, three, four sessions with them, they're giving feedback. You're gaining a few more brush strokes uh, of detail. As you do a, a lab test with them, there's a genetic test, there's a blood test, there's a functional test. You're adding more brush strokes. And you're getting more and more detail on that individual picture of your client. Okay, so I hope that uh, responds to that. Okay, Emma, just let me know if you'd like to come on and, and share some more. Um, okay, so Andrew, Andrew, send me a direct message so the rest of you want to see it. Um, with a targeted ketogenic diet, consuming smaller amounts of carbs during exercise without throwing one off ketosis have any performance benefits versus other high fat, low carb diets, particularly for resistance training and whether the carb load would be more beneficial before, during or after exercise. Okay, so you'd have to explain to me versus what kind of other um, low carb diets. The, the thing we get is a marketed diet. So the keto diet is a thing or the paleo diet is a thing or banting, which was Tim Noakes' approach is a thing. But when you actually go into it, every person uh, does that differently and every person has a different metabolic makeup. So in terms of getting into ketosis, somebody like myself would really struggle because I, I am very much a high metabolism, guzzle carb kind of person. So it would potentially take me quite a long time to get into that fat adapted state where my ketone levels would go up. Whereas other people, you know, many clients that I've worked with will go in quite easily. So that's a starting point. Alex Ferretti lectures on this in our course. So I was hoping to get him on tonight to comment as well, but unfortunately he's away lecturing. So basically, if you if you want to be in a ketosis state, if you're well enough fat adapted, you've been doing it long enough, and your body's stable at that, yes, you can throw in some carbohydrates to support those exercise sessions without long-term being thrown off ketosis, you probably are short-term. So yeah, that's quite a good scenario. But Alex will be the first to tell you that he won't work with somebody on a ketogenic diet unless they have at least six months to prepare before whatever the competitive thing they are working towards. So that shows you how serious you need to kind of get in terms of the adaptation. My approach on the ketosis is that naturally we should be going in and out of it all the time. Because if you come back to why are we dabbling with low carb diets, intermittent fasting, time restricted feeding, um, fasted training sessions at the moment, and why are we getting good 
some good results from that in, um, let's say, weight management, diabetes, obesity, um, different metabolic disease kind of considerations. If you go back just a couple of hundred years, maybe even a hundred years in our evolution, how did our ancestors live? And this is something I refer to with my clients over and over and over. What were your ancestors doing? What were they eating? Oh, um, okay, we're muted again. Oh, no, we're not. Um, so what were the ancestors eating? How were they eating? They would have periods. If you go back far enough, you'd have periods of uh, semi-starvation. And that was a strong stressor to the system that you had to adapt from. But were they training for a marathon at the same time? Were they training to do a multi-stage race in the Alps cycling, for example? Stress upon stress to me is a, a recipe for disaster. So if somebody's already really metabolically on the edge because of their training, and maybe because of their lifestyle, they're up early to get a training session and before going to the office, they're doing a long corporate day and then they're coming back, they need to spend some time with the kids, get to bed a bit too late, a couple of glasses of red wine to just kind of ease off the day. That's already a high, what I call life load. You then start loading in extra things like missing meals and um, low carb scenarios and fasted training sessions it loads up the physiology. So let's look at the context. If we've got a person who's overweight, insulin resistance, um, but their life's not particularly full on, yes, start doing the intermittent stuff. If you've got an athlete who, let's say they're more metabolically inclined to burning a higher ebb carbohydrates really well, and you stick them into a low carb environment for a long period of time, it can be a stressor to them. Some people will adapt well, some will not. But for me, let's find a middle ground to sort of go from, let's lead from the middle ground. And then let's have periods like um, Sam MP and James Morton are doing, where we deliberately fast the cyclists before their training session, but not when they need to do these repeated sprints and intervals up hills and and long days in the side, uh, in the in the saddle, okay. So I hope that Sammy, uh, you know, replies to your message uh, there, Andrew. Okay, so I invite any more questions, comments. I really like to hear from you guys. I know there's some good thinkers online at the moment. So if any of you would like to share your thoughts, it would be most most welcome. Or any any comments. Uh, Emma is saying, I like the principle of metabolic flexibility. So yeah, adaptive. We need to be adaptive. One, one downside that's been put over with being, let's say, keto or fat adapted is when you come into a performance scenario and maybe you do feed yourself carbs for a transient period to adapt to the to respond to that exercise your metabolic machinery is tuned down on carbohydrate, breaking down of carbohydrate. So let's mix up the diet. Let's change it. Um, let's try things. Let's, um, let's use ourselves, let's use our clients as experiment, experimentation. Um, I think that ultimately we, we're in this life to learn about ourselves. It's one of our one of our jobs. Okay, so Mimi, uh, since many athletes or the public in general have gut issues, you'd also have can have to consider their gut health because if they can't even digest and absorb fat adequately and have dysbiosis, then a high fat diet will just cause more issues. So thank you, Mimi. That's a really good point. Mimi specializes in gut health and immune health. So we have this assumption in general sports nutrition that if we create a diet, let's say we do the numbers, we create a diet that has 120 grams of protein for this person and 300 grams of fat in their diet that day, that they're going to just digest it all and deal with it all. 
but it's not necessarily the case. You might find a more greasy stool the next day. You might find corn, pieces of corn. If you, let's say you're revving up your carbohydrates and you're having lots of corn on the cob, you're going to find a lot of that in your, in your poo as well. So how well are you digesting different things? That's a key, key element. But not just digestibility and nutrient absorption. If you overwhelm, let's say, talk about genetic individuality, which I believe uh, gut health has a lot to do with, a lot of people tend towards hypochloridia when they're under stress, like myself included. And what's harder to break down? A heavy clumpy fat or a simpler carbohydrate? So um, in Tim Nook's book, for example, he's got what? he's got a smoothie and I'm trying to remember what's in it. It's got, it's pretty much made of cream and he's added extra things in there, like there was a coconut oil in there, and there was extra oil and cream. And it was, I looked at it and thought, wow, I would just be burping till tomorrow if I if I attempt to do that. But obviously, some people can do it. So yeah, very key point there, many. Okay, right, we're past the hour. Any last uh, comments or thoughts? Um, I would be very pleased to comment. Okay, Catherine. Catherine, I think we need to add sex, time of life. Yep, e.g. hormones, including impact of low carb on thyroid, impact of high fat diet and evidence of increased lipid polys, uh, lipid polysaccharides in the gut, mitochondrial trans, uh, sorry, mitochondrial dysfunction and ability to utilize fats along with genetics. Individualization is just key. So yeah, I mean, tonight it was very much about the carb fat thing because that's what dominates sports nutrition. But you can see how we can easily slip off to say, well, hey, what about how well we digest it? And how about genetic metabolism. Oh, and let's bring in our hormones. So, you know, insulin, cortisol patterning and blood sugar control is a really important thing, but thyroid, adrenals, um, sex hormones, they all have an impact on our metabolism. So, and then the high fat diet and, and, and gut stress, essentially, which can map out to systemic inflammation. Catherine's an expert in this area as well with uh, with gut stress in in sport. So especially endurance sport with running and triathlon and so on, there can be huge tr trauma, if you like, to the gut membrane, which causes uh, systemic inflammation. And we need to balance the diet around that potential and improve recovery mechanisms as well. So thank you, Catherine. All right, so I'll finish the, the call here. Please return next month. We have Amy, who's going to be talking about uh, immunity. And then we will have one final one for the year. We're also in the phase that I'm about to start planning for the new year. So um, if you any of you would like to talk and have some good ideas, please get in touch. Okay, right. Good night, everyone and uh, keep well.